Hello and good afternoon. My name is Janetta Davis-Joyce and I am one of the vice presidents at CACA. I am joined by Jesse and Bobby who will be supporting the webinar today in the chat box. I just have a few housekeepings before we get started. First, this webinar is being recorded as a training educational tool for the prevention field. And we will be uploading it to CACA's website. And second, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. So please make, um, please make a note of your questions so we can uh, designate a time during the end of this session for you all to ask to raise your hand and get your questions answered. Um, Thank you all for taking the time to be here with us. Happy Prevention Month. And don't forget the DEA Take Back Days this Saturday. And we have an exciting and an informative webinar for you today. This webinar is a partnership and developed by SAMHSA, CSAP, and CACA. Today's webinar is titled Coalition Works, Elevating Youth Voices. We will hear from our federal and national leaders and then spend most of our time today talking and engaging with adult coalition leaders from the states of Illinois, Alabama, and Michigan. We will also hear from youth leaders who present groundbreaking strategies for increasing awareness and education about the dangers of alcohol and drug misuse, and most importantly, solutions in their communities, ultimately saving lives. To start us off today, we have two great leaders that will provide our inspiration for the Prevention Month and set the vision for our webinar today. First, let me introduce Dr. General Price, retired from the U.S. Army, President and CEO of CACA, and he will be followed by Captain Christopher Jones, Director of the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention at SAMHSA. Dr. Price? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Major General Barry Price, President and CEO of CACA. It is truly an honor to be with you today as we celebrate Prevention Month with our partners at SAMHSA. This is a wonderful opportunity to highlight the critical role that our coalitions play in communities across the nation, especially when it comes to elevating our youth voices. Our theme today is telling the coalition prevention story, and I can't think of a more powerful story to tell than that of of our young people stepping up as leaders and agents of change. Youth are not just the leaders of tomorrow, they are the catalyst for change today. When given the tools, support and encouragement, young people can transform their communities in ways that are meaningful and lasting. This is exactly what CACTUS coalitions are all about, empowering communities to solve local challenges and elevate local voices. Our coalitions work tirelessly to engage youth, to listen to their perspectives, and to amplify their stories of prevention. The work they do, the mentorship, the partnership, and the education makes a difference. It creates an environment that young leaders need to thrive and address the challenges they see around them. We know that youth understand the power of prevention better than anyone because they live it. They see its impact every single day. This is why today's conversation is so important. It is about sharing strategies, success stories, and approaches that work so we can all become better at uplifting and empowering our young people. By telling the prevention story through their eyes, we not only create more effective solutions, but also ensure that, that the prevention message resonates across generations. I'm excited for this discussion we have ahead, and I'm confident that together, we will continue to strengthen our communities, one youth leader at a time. Thank you for your commitment to this mission, and thank you for being here today to help us elevate the voices that matter the most, the voices of our young people. Now let's hear from our partner, Captain Chris Jones, and then we will dive deep into today's conversation and explore how we can tell the coalition prevention story even more effectively. Thank you for your participation today. Thank you for joining this national webinar, Coalition's Work Elevating Youth Voices. I'm Chris Jones, Director of the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention at SAMHSA. 
I first want to say thank you to General Price and the CADCA team for their partnership on this webinar and for their longstanding partnership with SAMHSA. I'm so excited to be joining today during Prevention Month, a time when we can elevate the importance and impact of prevention. And the reality is prevention has never been more important. The substance use landscape continues to evolve with the spread of highly toxic fake pills containing fentanyl, resurgent stimulants like methamphetamine, rising deaths due to alcohol use, and the ever-present challenges of vaping. The risks associated with substance use have never been higher. And all of this is happening against the backdrop of rising mental health challenges, especially among young people. These novel and unique challenges mean that we have to approach our prevention work in new and innovative ways, addressing the acute urgency of overdose deaths while remaining laser focused on root drivers of substance use and upstream prevention. But what remains constant is prevention science and the decades of community-based experience and scientific research that show prevention works. In fact, your efforts in communities document that impact every day. Coalitions are the backbone of prevention efforts in communities throughout our country. You're working to improve the lives of individuals, families, and communities by bringing sectors of the community together to address the shared challenges of substance use and overdose. And as we focus on telling the prevention story during Prevention Month, I want to especially lift up the importance of youth voices. Listening and learning from youth about their experiences and challenges is critical to ensuring that our prevention efforts are relevant and meeting the moment we're in. At SAMHSA, we have multiple ongoing activities to directly engage with youth and create empowerment opportunities for young people. This includes our work with CADCA, 4-H, HOSA, and many others. And I'm so excited that today you'll hear from both adult and youth leaders of coalitions about the work they're doing in their communities. So thank you again for joining us for this important webinar, and thank you all for everything you're doing each day in your community to advance prevention. Thank you both, Dr. Price and Captain Jones. Let's now introduce our first coalition. First, we will hear from the Love Detroit Prevention Coalition from Detroit, Michigan. Dr. Ganae Dudley is the chair of the coalition and CEO of the Youth Connection, joined by two student leaders, Maya and Daylin. Welcome, Dr. Gren Dudley. Thank you so much, Janetta. I am excited about being here. And you can go to the next slide for me. And then these are these are my kids. Um, I get really possessive, and so you know, just have to sort of bear with me. And as Janetta sh shared, I am the president and CEO of the Youth Connection, and also the chair of the Love Detroit Prevention Coalition. We are a seven. We are in our seventh year of our drug free communities, and we're significantly supported by the Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network that supports our efforts in prevention and in harm reduction. I'm excited to say that um, to date, since 2018, we have trained over 6,000 individuals uh, in Narcan, and we have saved over 108 lives. And so that's just part of some of the things that we're doing. But more importantly, especially during this prevention month, um, we're focusing on our youth. And I have with me Maya Carter. And Maya has, she's a, she's been an absolutely delightful student to have engaged with our coalition. She's gone with us to CATCA on several occasions, and she's been outspoken about what she sees as some of the challenges that are impacting her school and our community. And then there's Dalen. Now, I have one here, Sergeant Dalen, but Dalen got a promotion. He's part of what we call our uh, Detroit Police Explorers, and he got a promotion, and he is now a lieutenant. So sorry about that, Dalen. It is Lieutenant Dalen, and, and Lieutenant Dalen is part of our Love Detroit Prevention Coalition as well. Through the Explorers and partnering with the Explorers, he gets the opportunity to go through the trainings that we provide along with the things that they do all across the city for the police explorers. But part of what we try to do is to make sure that he also gets, and those kids that are part of that, get exposed to some of the things we're talking about with substance use prevention. Next slide, please. One of the big challenges, next slide. One of the big challenges that we have with um, engaging youth, I think we hear it all the time. How do we get them to the table and how do we keep them? You can click on this for me. You go to where they are. And part of going to where they are is our explorers. There are, we have hundreds of explorers across the city of Detroit with our neighborhood police officers. And one key officer that leads that, um, Dalen's dad, um, uh, 
uh, he is our MPO Robinson has just been instrumental in making sure that substance use is part of the training that our kids are exposed to. But we are also in the schools. It's one thing to say that we can grab kids and hopefully they'll come to us. But I think my staff is in probably about all of the middle schools that are in the three zip codes that we cover on the east side of Detroit and the three high schools that are there. We have been getting invitations to participate our, and coalition members are in other schools that are throughout our, our district, both private as well as um, some of the uh, public schools that are there. So it's important to go to where they are, but give them things to do. One of the things that we really also support is community engagement and the things that they can do to give back to their communities. Um, throughout the summer, one of the things that our kids have been doing is painting the fire hydrants. We partner with the City of Detroit Water Department and our kids are out there painting the fire hydrants. And I didn't know that there were special colors that fire hydrants had to be painted. And so they were there I watched, but they, our kids were there and they were engaged. And it was something that they can then see, hey, we're giving back to our communities. So engage them in the work that we're doing. We had, uh, I, I think, one of the things that that really sort of moves and help change community norms is have our kids confront the adults and ask them the question, what are you going to do about it? Our kids presented before city council about the number of illegally operating marijuana dispensaries that were just in our zip codes. And they asked that question, what are you going to do about it? And I'm going to share with you the results of that question. And so here you see them, one, presenting to city council and saying, hey, there's something that's going on in our community and we want to see change. But I think the other thing that we have to do is celebrate the kids that, in, that spend their time working on these efforts in our community. Our kids just received the Spirit of Detroit Award and they received a an award from the White House on the work that they were doing in the communities. But we wanna make sure that each and every time, well done, we say that and we engage them in what we're doing. Next slide. Some of the outcomes of what we're talking about that our youth took the responsibility for. Um, we trained them in what was called photo voice and environmental scans. And we asked them to go through the community and take a picture of what substance use looks like in their communities. And one of the this was one of the pictures of the marijuana dispensary that was illegally operating in their zip codes based on the kids having done the done the homework. Uh, they went out and they did the homework and they, they also had to write the narrative on the pictures that they saw. And this is one of the pictures and their narrative was one got closed, one more opened up. We won't stop. We won't give up. And that's the commitment that our kids to say, wait a minute, this isn't fair to push this in our community when, hey, you can do the right thing and go get the license appropriate, but make sure that you don't sell to our kids. So the result of them going before city council is this dispensary was shut down. But the outcome that was when you're talking about community level change is that one of our council members then uh, made a request and created an ordinance that required 2% of gross marijuana sale tax go to youth substance use prevention. This started because our kids said not on our watch. Our law enforcement and youth sector has conducted tobacco and vape compliance checks in 22 retailers and uh, Dalen was part of that. And he talked about why are we, you know, why are we selling to youth vapes and tobacco products and alcohol in our communities? And that one of the things that they wanted to do was a campaign to stop it. So the Love Detroit Prevention Police Explorers launched a Facebook tobacco campaign and has over 3,000 views. So when we talk about the power of youth, we're really talking about one, how to engage them go to where they are, and then celebrate their successes. So with that, I pass it back to you, Janetta, to go on to our next coalition. Great, great. And just um, before we go to our next coalition, if you could go back just a little bit, I want to see if Maya and Daylin have anything to add at this point. Anything to share? Okay, well, we've got lots of questions for you. So we will go to our second coalition. Um, our next coalition is Drug-Free Communities of Dallas County Hope Leaders from Selma, Alabama. Um, Jaria Martin is the head Hope Leader, um, dealer and coalition leader, joined by Sydney and also by Radiance. And they are the assistant head junior Hope Leaders. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jaria. Hey, my name is Jaria. Ask me how I feel. 
I'm a hope dealer, so I got to keep it real. Give me 10 seconds. Let me say what's on my mind. The kids, all my homies, man, we kick it all the time. <laughs> you guys, my name is Jaria uh, Martin. Um, you guys may also know me as a CACA trainer. I know a lot of people come to my trainings when I do CACA um, and other organizational work, but we're here today to talk about the outstanding work that our youth coalition uh, located here in historic Selma, Alabama. Um, all the amazing things we've been able to accomplish since 2016. Um, we started in 2016 with our DFC and CARA grant. Um, we since have received the SAMHSA's um, Stop At Grant. So it's ironic that we're here today with CAC and SAMHSA because we received funding from both. Um, and But just since 2016, we've been able to lower uh, the past 30-day use of both alcohol and marijuana all through using fun, engaging, and effective strategies. We meet youth where they are. Uh, next slide, please. And so today I have here with me, and they're actually going to help me during this presentation, um, our head junior hope dealer, who is Sydney, and then we have Radiance, who's also our assistant head junior hope dealer. And a really cool fun fact about both of them, uh, Sydney actually serves on uh, the Youth Advisory Board for CACA. And Radiant serves on the Youth Advisory Board for the CDC. Um, and so uh, they're excited to share with you guys today. Next slide. So just to review a few of our successes, um, our youth coalition, guys, get this, it's over 150 youth members strong. Um, that's because we have youth coalition members in every single high school, middle school, and even two private schools in Selma and Dallas County. Um, some of the cool things that we do to engage youth um, is reach them through the arts. So we've created several viral drug-free music videos. You'll get to see our latest video um, at the end of today's session. Um, but we have viral drug-free music videos. Uh, back in 2020, we were recognized by the ONDCP and the First Lady. She gave us a huge shout out on all of her social media pages. Um, we were awarded by the White House just uh, last year with the Blue Ribbon Coalition Award. Um, and what's really cool is that right now, we are featured on the CDC's website um, as a model coalition because of our fun and engaging uh, youth strategies. Um, and again, our creative strategies have lowered past 30-day use of both alcohol and marijuana in Dallas County by almost 20%. Um, and we're not even, and we're in year eight now. Um, and so we're hoping that it'll be, we'll see an even larger increase uh, by the time we end in 2026. Next slide, please. And so I'll go, I'm going to turn it over to Sydney and Radiance to tell you guys about one of our uh, big successes, which is our Kids uh, Hope Show. Um, they actually have their own radio show. And I'll turn it over to them to uh, speak on it very briefly. Sydney, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sydney. And like Jaria said, I want the head Hope Dealer. And I'm also serving as DFC's intern this year. Um, the Hope Show is a show that is led by uh, private school, city schools, and our county school representatives. And we take the time every second Tuesday of the month to interview different community leaders and kind of get an idea of how they incorporate being drug free into whatever they do. We have interviewed people from different restaurants we've interviewed people um different attorneys and we just, just like to kind of involve the community with us and kind of hear from them and give them a chance to speak on another level i'll pass it to radiance to kind of talk a little bit more about some of her favorite interviews that we have had and some of the experiences that we've had during our show Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Radiant Ransom. I am assistant head hope dealer. Um, we've had a wide variety of hosts. Well, hosts, guests, whatever you want to consider them. Um, ranging from our police chief to even principals at our school. My favorite has to be. Oh, we've had a lot, but I have a few. My favorite has to be our most recent one. My used to be counselor she is now principal at our local alternative school for our county and she seen her in a different light you know she gave like good strategies for not just us but for also parents on how to you know how to convince 
student under the age from getting it? Because, you know, sometimes we, you know, we kind of dismiss the younger generation. Uh, you know, just like, you know, you know, you know just it's, it's unknowing. So, you know, just seeing that. And also, with our Hope Show, we've also been noticed by the CDC for our Hope Show because it's such a different stand on getting the youth, not just the youth, but the community engaged in our work and what we do and how we do it. All right. Thank you, Sydney and Radiance. Next slide, please. Um, and last but not least, we want to just hit briefly on um, something else we found tremendous success in um, doing. Uh, we also engage all of our even elementary schools, uh, middle schools, and high schools, and school-wide junior hope dealer activities. Um, and so I'll just turn it over one more time briefly to the kids uh, to talk about um, just some of these school-wide activities. Um, and we'll start with Sydney since she serves as our intern and has been able to help us with a lot of our school-wide activities. Thank you. So like Jaria said, we have been having our school-wide pep rallies and just this few weeks ago, we had just finished having most of our elementary school pep rallies and they have been really fun. We have been able to interact with the kids. We've been able to play fun games with them and start teaching them at a young age about the dangers of drugs. And you'll actually be surprised just how many kids have already seen and have already been exposed to different types of drugs, such as vapes, marijuana, and alcohol. And then in our high schools, even before I became an um, intern, I've been with um, Jaria and the Hope Dealers since I was in the seventh grade. We normally have our high school pep rallies and they normally go the same way, except, you know, we obviously can't have them as, I guess you would say, kitty as we do for our elementary schools, but we always inclu include everyone in the schools and we always just make sure that everyone know that it's, a very, it's very easy to have fun without having drugs being involved. Thanks, Sydney. Radiance, what's your take? Um, as someone that actively participates in the pet rallies, we've had a few at my school. Um, it's such a sorry, I'm kind of nervous, but it's such a you know involving moment. You know, including the games, not just having it be an assembly or like a lecture. It's involvement. You know, like you show them like what happens when you have bad lungs. What happens when you drink when you drink and drive. What happens when, you know, you do something and you don't think it's going to affect you, but you don't get to the finish line. So I feel like, you know, our pet rallies not just educate, but they involve. And that's what we do as, a, as Drugs for Queens in Jones County. We involve the students, not just involve them, but we also evolve them. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Radiance and Sydney. Um, and so uh, besides our drug free pep rallies in e-school, we also uh, pride ourselves on bringing in our community leaders into the school. So you can see on one of these pictures here, we actually have our sheriff's department, police department, uh, our local hospital, our residents, um, the younger doctors come in and lead trainings, uh, school wide trainings for uh, our youth as well. And so those are just a few of the school wide activities that we have an opportunity to do. Next slide. And that's the next coalition. Um, so thank you guys. And we'll, I guess we'll, we'll circle back uh, when it's time for the Q and A. Yes, we, we will um, have you guys back for the Q and A. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, listen, we get your questions ready. After this coalition speaks, we will move into our question and answer session. Our final coalition for this webinar is Stand Strong Coalition from Linkshire, Illinois, serving the D125 feeder area. And, and we'll hear all about that. And um, the coalition leader is Hannah Weisba. She is the executive director, and she is joined by two great student leaders, Kobe and Yana. Both are Catalyst Youth Coalition leaders. Hannah, welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Hannah Weisba with Stand Strong Coalition. So we can go to our next slide. So as it was mentioned, we are in Lincolnshire, Illinois. Um, that's just Northwest of the city of Chicago. Um, so I am joined today by Yana and Colby. Both are committee leaders for our youth coalition, um, each serving for a policy committee. They are so large and so strong in their efforts that it's broken down by local and state policy initiatives. So we'll go to our next slide. 
Just a little bit of background about Stand Strong Coalition. We are very quickly approaching our 10-year anniversary next month. So the coalition was started by a concerned parent back in 2014. Um, something unique about our area in which we serve is we do serve just the one high school district that has just one high school. However, it is a very large school with over 4,600 students in the building. Um, it is continuing to grow year after year. That number is getting larger and larger. As well, it's a, it's a very diverse school as well. Um, we are about 52% of a minority school. So I know a lot of times, and that was even surprising to me, when you think of a school out in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago, that's not necessarily what you think about um, having that level of diversity, but that's something that we're very proud of our community and how so many people are able to come together, a mix of cultures and backgrounds to create one strong community all together um, within this feeder, the Stevenson feeder area. So our substances of focus are alcohol, marijuana, tobacco and vaping, as well as prescription drugs. And with the great work of the students, we've been able to see consistent decreases in our youth substance use from um, when we started tracking back in 2016 up until most recently last spring in 2024. So you'll see overall, we've had a 72% reduction in alcohol use, a 74% reduction in marijuana use, and a 60% reduction in prescription drug misuse. Um, this work would not be able to be done without the great work of the staff over at Stevenson High School, their substance abuse prevention coordinator, as well as those students. And as I introduce our students who are going to share some of their highlights, um, General Price had said in his video that youth are a catalyst for change, which was just such a perfect uh, segue for me as our youth are the Catalyst Youth Coalition. So I am going to pass it off with our next slides to Yana and Colby, and they can share a little bit more about the work that they are doing. Hi everyone, I'm Yana. I'm a junior at Stevenson High School. And again, I'm the director of the local policy committee. Um, I think our youth engagement, engagement strategies here at Catalyst and Stand Strong are at the heart of what we do. We follow a committee method, which is like where we can compartment, compartmentalize each aspect of what the coalition does. So me and Colby both work on the policy aspect of things, but we have over 18 committees uh, with 180 members total and we cover athletics, community connections, um, freshman advisory and all other sorts of things. And then another big part of our coalition is center schools. So in Stevenson, we have six other middle schools um, which feed into the high school. And so we work with them on a monthly basis um, and try to get them involved into prevention activism and advocacy work at a young age. Yeah, they're gonna build Can off of that. we go to the next slide really quick? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And so kind of building off of that, um, some of that youth leadership development we get through the uh, committee method, it helps us to build experts in different areas. So we have awesome public speakers. We have very skilled researchers. We have people who work on public policy, such as Jan and myself. And all of this kind of goes into building a very strong community initiative that helps us go towards some of those aforementioned stats that are showing how big of an effect we've had and how much you know we've had a connection with our community. Yeah, and I think going off of that, one of the reasons we've had such like such success is because of our community connections. We've worked with local law enforcement and village boards, as well as state legislators. And I think building those connections is really just how important youth act youth action is. For sure. And developing those important leaders within our club, within our community has been a very big thing and something we've been working towards continuously, nonstop since 2014 when we were developed. We've had a steady flux of student leaders working in all of those areas, and that's been even more impacted by our middle school development. We have uh, two great middle school coordinators within our club, and they do an awesome job of connecting with the middle schoolers to help build our substance abuse prevention profile in that area, that lower grade levels. And then when they come to Stevenson, we have an even bigger club body waiting to welcome them and help them avoid substances. Yeah, and I think another big part of our like engagement, especially in such a big school, is our special events committee. They work on events for school dances. Next week is Red Ribbon Week. Um, and it really just increases morale and uh, prevention strategies. Yeah. I'd also love to give a call out to our policy committees. Uh, so they always stay true to our initial goal of 
you know, helping prevention in the Stevenson community. So we started out with just local community initiatives. They've built over time to include all of our local law enforcement, our village board committee meetings, and then building up to our state legislators and sometimes uh, our federal ones as well, which has been a very big uh, impact of our club as a whole and kind of represents us growing and adapting as the club gets older. Uh, can we go to the next slide? We have some really great photos. Thank you. Yeah, so if you see here on the right side, uh, this was our legislative luncheon last year. We hosted, I believe it was over a dozen of our uh, state and federal uh, congressmen, as well as some local, uh, local legislators. Um, so you'll see Dick Durbin there in the green tie, one of the longest tenured U.S. senators. Um, we were able to bring him in and speak with him, share our initiatives. Um, we also had some middle schoolers that are collaborating with our legislators to express their experiences. And this was a very uh, powerful experience for both us getting able to see the connection between our, you know, even younger than us, the middle schoolers and our legislators and being able for them, I think, to have an idea of what it's like going on in the schools. Yeah. And then another aspect of like our campaign for prevention is our slogan, what's your why? And you can see a lot of students wearing those what's your why shirts. And it's a question that like when we say it in our school, it's automatically associated with the great things that we do. Um, and really just all our community events have like proven to be very success successful. Yeah, like What's Your Why campaign has been a very impactful part of our messaging and it's something that's become very associated with prevention in our community. Um, most of our events here, you'll see us wearing those What's Your Why t-shirts and a total, um, I think we have over a dozen uh, school events every year that help build us up as a community coalition that's really connecting with our student body and other places outside in the community. You'll see a sticker shock event in the bottom left. Um, as well as some other events where we connect with students and help share our message and establish ourselves within the community. All right, thanks hey. Colby and Yana. So I think we are good to move on to our next slide. Wonderful, thank you so much, Hannah. Um, I just want to say before we get into our questions and, and um, for the panelists that I'd like, I'm gonna ask the first question. So I would like for Maya and Daylin to tell me, why do you think it's important for teens and young adults to work together on initiatives like this? Maya or Dylan? I believe, um, hello, sorry, Hi. there's a lot going on behind me. Um, okay. I believe it is important for teens. <laughs> I think Go ahead, Maya. And I, I believe. Uh, sorry, my yeah. walkie's going off. I'm still at work. Um, I believe it's important for teens and young adults to work together, or any adults, on things like this because I personally believe it starts at home. It starts with parents. It starts with what happens inside of a household that can dictate how a teen acts and what they get themselves into as a a mechanism, a coping, something to kind of forget, forgive and forget, if that makes sense. As Dr. D stated earlier, we did go out and look at dispensaries and had went to city council to talk about how these dispensaries in this area aren't legally allowed to operate. And it's a lot of these marijuana dispensaries or vape shops around schools not just in our specific area codes, but in my community that kids are going to and getting adults to buy them marijuana or buy them breezes. And it's really sad that these adults aren't understanding the importance and the dangers of buying a kid a vape or marijuana because it's killing them and they don't they don't recognize or understand that or some just don't care. But I feel like if we work together with adults and give them the resources and the um, try to educate them about it, then we can make a difference together because it, we're a team, teens and adults. We're a team, young adults, to try to help that way the younger generation. I personally have a little sibling. I don't want her growing up in a world where it's okay to smoke or she's going down the street and somebody's asking her, you know, trying to sell her weed and she's 11, you know, I don't want that for the kids out here 
is happening. She's in middle school. She told me a kid accidentally bought marijuana brownies to school in the fifth grade. So it's it's happening not just in the middle school and high school. It's happening in elementary schools. I feel like we need to make a difference. So we need to come together with the parents to try to make a difference about this. Right. Thank you so much, Maya, for all your hard work and, and answering my question. And I'm just going to turn it over to Daylin really quick to talk about maybe data and how you gather data support for your coalition. So, what, oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. So one way we gather data is we do compliance checks. And so what we do is we will go to gas stations, we'll go to schools, stores, and they will give us checks and uh, information about are they being sold, vapes being sold to minors, that and then how close are like say the gas stations or the drug stores to the schools so we can get that to our police officers and maybe see if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing not selling to the kids and also trying to make sure they're within the legal distance I forgot what it was but you cannot have a drug store near a school it's a certain amount of distance but using that that's how we figure out some of the information we get. Great. Thank you so much. And now we've we've got a couple of questions. So um, you all get ready. Um, we'll take our first question. Jesse, Bobby. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just looking at the Q&A in the chat, um, we have about 10 questions. So I'll just start mm -hmm. off with a question from um, David, he said, where I live, um, Black communities are most impacted by fatal overdoses include involving opioids like fentanyl. Can you name three key messages you tell people who challenge training on substance use awareness, especially for opioids, that may say you're promoting drug use? Okay. Good question. Anyone want to start? Our adult leaders, our <laughs> young people? I'll actually, I could start. Um, with that question, I feel like that question is um it kind of relates to us as because in Dallas County, at least in my school system, for um example, we we have a strong black community and we also have lost someone, you know, to a fentanyl overdose. So I feel like the one one of the messages that you really have to get out to people is that you it hurts more people than just yourself because I feel like sometimes what people don't realize when they are using drugs or in, in any sort is that it's hurting everyone around them because you're going to be hurting your loved ones and then with some of these drugs just you using it in the same area you could be hurting somebody you could be hurting somebody else like contact high or it could just be like with fentanyl being able to just be laced on anything you can hurt somebody else who doesn't even has no clue what's even going on and another message I'll just get this one then I'll let someone else um leave another message another message I feel like you really have to um touch with them is that there are alternative things to do that are safe and that are fun and that are healthy. And because I feel like that some most people, especially with teenagers, I feel like most people are using drugs either it's either for two reasons. It's either because they A think that it's it's the only way that they can cope with things that they are going through, or it's B because they feel like is everyone's doing it. So it can't be that bad and that it has to just be something that's actually cool and something that's fun to do. And I feel like for both of them, it's just one of the things you have to realize there are better coping methods. And even with us living in a small community, we still have things that, you know, you could participate in sports. You could, you could participate in all these trips that you could be offered through multiple organizations, even other than just ours. So I feel like like we have to really make sure that we are pushing these alternative coping mechanisms to them as, as well so that they will know that these mechanisms exist. And then for the sake with them thinking that it's something that's cool for them to do, it also is kind of a mix with that as well. We have to show them that you can have fun by without using drugs because I, I've never used any type of drug. I've never drunk anything in my life. And I can say that I've had, I'm still having a pretty fun teenager experience and I enjoy you know, like every Thing that a regular teenager enjoys. So I really think that it's just a matter of us, you know, pushing them messages out to our, to everyone, actually. Great, Sydney. Thank, Thank you. Can um, I chime in too um, yeah. on that? I'm 
one, our kids, Maya made a comment that they are powerful messengers, but we also know that they can, they make a difference in the communities that we serve. We train our kids and all of our police explorers were trained on Narcan harm reduction. We are terrified of the influx of fentanyl and the opioids that are in our community. And I am excited to say it, one of our youth that we trained in Narcan was responsible for saving two lives. And it really, it's not that they don't see it. It is not that it's not in our communities, but giving them the resources and having them step up to the plate and change the community picture, but also being in a position to save lives. Our kids are doing it. Great. They should, all of the kids are doing it. And thank you so, so much for all the hard work that you guys are doing. And um, Dr. Dudley, thank you for that comment. We're going to move to the next question because they're piling in. Yes, they are. Um, so for the next one, this one's directed at um, Yana and Colby. Um, they, David said, can you describe why you feel it's important to work so closely with police and law enforcement? Yeah, I can kind of start that. Um, right now we're working on just building these relations because I think when we get to hear from chief of police, we get to understand what pushback we might receive, concerns from village board and law enforcement, and it helps us like better approach our proposals. Yeah, and coming up from like the state perspective as well, having some of those enforcement mechanisms in place uh, is going to be like super important in enacting any of our policies that we've been working on, just because it's so hard to ensure that people are actually abiding by the regulations we want them to see. So like we mentioned before, uh, the minimum regulations for school distance and uh, marijuana dispensaries, it's been a big issue we've seen um, with vapes, especially in our community, and making sure that our local law enforcement is able to translate the policies we're enacting is super important, making sure that all of our prevention efforts are reaching their like full capacity in our communities. And just having that tied to our local communities as we go through any different tier of legislation. Yeah, and I think me and Hannah went to an event uh, this Tuesday, um, and it was really interesting to see because we had on one side of the table a student who were advocating for like the youth perspective, Hannah and the coalitions, law enforcement, and the village board, and then seeing how all these perspectives came together, and it was an open discussion on regulating Delta ATHC. Um, and we kind of got to see what law enforcement, what their experiences are on compliance checks, what village boards see, like on putting on a trustee hat and seeing like this entire issue and then hearing the youth perspective. And I think hearing all of that really helps us approach these uh, problems. Great. Thank you, Yana and Kobe. Um, our next question. So this is also kind of a follow up question to um, Yana and Colby and Hannah's discussion from Stand Strong Coalition. Um, someone said, I work with an organization outside of the school system. How did you connect stakeholders to start collaborating with people in school districts to get your programs to the youth? Um, but yeah, really anyone um, can speak on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say really quickly, I think the biggest champion that we have right now is our school has a substance abuse prevention coordinator, Dr. Christina Cortese. And so she is the one who serves as a one of the main sponsors for the Catalyst Youth Coalition within the school. And because of her experience, um, the coalition actually started and that timeline coincided with when she started this position at the high school. So really it's been an all in effort. So being able to develop that relationship um, and then a lot of positive peer pressure between the high school and then the middle schools, because like I said, in our area, it's a very tight knit community. Everyone wants to be part of the Stevenson high school community. And so then you're able to leverage some of those relationships and bring in the middle schools. They didn't come all in at the same time. Like I said, we're in year 10 of the DFC. It's been a work in progress and schools are at different levels and that's, that's okay. That, you know, as long as they're doing prevention work, that's what we want to happen. So um, really, I would say it was just finding that key person within the school building who got something started and then working to build that network of relationships from there. Yeah, I also kind of want to pitch in. Um, it's tiny successes that we start with, right? Whether it's a successful event or a new partnership that we created and then going to like the statewide like level policy um, and success at that level as well. That's what really like, leads to how how we are as a coalition 
yeah, and kind of build off of that, we didn't start with 18 committees and like all these different initiatives. We started with the idea of prevent substance abuse in the Stevenson community. And then when a roadblock comes up, we're like, okay, how do we solve this? Maybe that's coordinating with our athletics. Maybe that's working with our local legislators. Maybe that's with our state legislators. And every time something comes up, we just establish a solution to it and we adapt our club. And that's how we get to kind of where we are today. Great, thank you. And our next question. Yeah, definitely. So um, we have a few questions coming in, um, but um, one of the common themes is what can we do to reach parents and adults who um, are allowing teens to utilize cannabis and believe it's safer if the teens use it with them? Okay, I'd like to hear from each of our coalitions. Well, we, I, I'm going to, one of the oh. things that oh. engaging some of the parents and the community members with a question like that, and I'm going to kick it to Dalen. Um, the, the Explorers and our youth did a town hall um, based on some of the concerns that we're talking about, you know, where kids were getting tobacco. And our kids called out the adults. They called us out. And so, Dalen, do you remember uh, the the town hall that you guys did and put us on Front Street? I do. And I also remember the one kid who talked about the vapes going on in his school and he was in kindergarten. I think it was, or the first grade, and you're talking about they're getting down there. See, some things I also think about too is education. As if we tell people the negative effects and get it uh, out there more, they would know not to do it and everybody would be educated. As with some things, it's not just they don't know that it's wrong to do, it's just they don't know right from wrong. So if we tell them that it's wrong to do, they will stop doing it. Okay, great, thank you. And I'd like for um, Sydney and Radiance or um, Jaria to answer that question. I'll let our you. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I was walking around school, so I'm trying to go. Um, oh, hold on. Let me just put a space where y'all can hear, buddy. But as far as calling out adults and hearing, that's the one whose mother was a strong believer of, as long as you do it around me, it don't matter. Um, the shift to he didn't do it at all. He's right over here. But the shift from he didn't do it at all is a very big shift. I feel like it's sometimes you have to let them know, like, even if I do do it with you, even if I do do it around you, it's still not okay. The effects still are the same. The health issues are still the same. Every every everything that can happen away from you are still is still happening. And sometimes even worse because of overuse around parents over around adults. So I feel as far as educate them, I just feel that it should be let them know, like, hey, it's around you, yes, that doesn't make it any better. It can sometimes make it work. Because once you feel like, oh, yeah, I can get around my parents, they don't care, da da da, you start to overuse it, you start to overdo it. And then that causes more than just addiction, but also pain. So, yes. Great, thank you. And, um, Jaria, were you going to, uh, uh, uh radio? Sure some comments sure. so just very briefly i um, mean you guys will see you know in the video that i hope we'll have a chance to uh play that we are creative and even reaching the parents you know we know that our parents you know here is more of a kind of hip-hop culture and so we actually even use song and music to deliver that messaging um you know on uh uh not using drugs around your kids and also you know not approving you know of their use of drugs around you um so uh we do it through uh music as well and just uh other types of messaging uh, uh, campaigns. Great, thank you. And Hannah? Yeah, so I will say, you know, parent engagement is definitely something that we are continuing to work on. So really just being in the community, learning from them and finding these groups of where the parents are at. Um, one of our most recent finds last spring was Parents let us know they don't all read their school principal's newsletter, but they all read their school PTA Facebook pages. So you can bet this summer we worked to make contacts with all of those school PTAs and did find success for some of our programming this fall. So um, just trying to think outside of the box and unique ways to find the parents where they're at, I think is what's helped us the most. Janetta, Maya has her hand up. Oh, Maya, I didn't see it. Please join in. Um. I want to say that, like like I said before, it starts at home. It starts with the parents. Our parents are supposed to teach us that 
what's right, what's wrong, what's safe, what's dangerous. I personally have seen parents go out and buy their kid breezes and marijuana because they've given them the money for it because they don't think it's harmful to their child. When in reality, you are killing your own child because you think, oh, yeah, it's going to make me a cool parent if I try to reason with them on this level. Again, it starts with the parents. So we have to teach these um, these parents. When I went to CACA um, this past summer and we got to speak to um, certain people and our, we had a personal conference, I said, we need to have a, we have our youth section of CACA. We need to have an adult section to teach them this is right and this is wrong. And why that the adults, to, to try to give them a deeper understanding of why doing drugs is bad. Because probably back when they were kids, it was okay. But now it's killing the youth. It's killing the kids. Like I said, I don't want my little sister to grow up in a world where her friend's parents are, she goes over to her friend's house and her parent and their parents are letting them smoke. And as she's getting older, I'm not saying now because she stay at home but as she gets older I don't want to have to go through that I don't want to get a call saying that she's in danger because she was around the wrong people and they were smoking or that the parent thinks that it's okay to take them to the liquor store to get alcohol or to get marijuana because it's not so we have to educate the parents like y'all are educating us about it to let them know this is wrong and that we can't keep doing this because it is killing all these kids off and they don't realize that it's a bigger deal than it really actually is right thank you for sharing maya and um we're going to move to we've got a couple more questions so we're going to move to another question before we bring this to conclusion only for today we're going to we're going to enhance this in the future go ahead jesse so we have a question um, from Jacob. It says, for the young leaders, how can we as co community organizations better and more meaningfully include you in your voice? Um, what would you do if you were in our shoes right now? Um, and I will add to that. Why did you join the coalition? So let's start with Yana and Kobe. Um, for me, it's always been like a big thing in my family, avoiding substance abuse. Uh, so that kind of message was always part of my identity, like growing up, seeing people walking through the city, seeing people that have, like smoking in midair and saying, oh, that's probably not a great idea for them. And then wanting to prevent people my age from doing that in our community. And you come to the high school level and you hear stories of people drinking at parties on the weekends and people having to get their stomachs pumped and people smoking the bathrooms. And when you're hearing these stories from my younger brother, He's in middle school. And I hear these stories from his bathrooms. And I'm like, this is horrifying. This needs to change. And kind of hearing that and having that family message of, you're right, like substance abuse isn't okay. Having that kind of combined messaging makes it so that I was inspired to join my coalition. And then for the other question, the importance of, or how we like to interact with our adults, they provide a very useful connection for us. Like we have important messages to share. The adults have very important backgrounds that they are able to uh, connect us with. So they have education that we find very much useful, um, as well as just having those connections with the community, being able to coordinate with our awesome adult leaders has been a very impactful thing for us, especially just getting some of that wisdom and their knowledge having been in the field for longer than us, for sure. Um, and oftentimes for a long time, having that wisdom has been very beneficial for us. I think also going off of that, I think having adults value youth perspective is so, so important, right? Like youth are in the community, they know what's going on. So having outlets for youth to talk about that, talk about their experiences, because that is how you move forward with, forward with action, right? Great, thank you. And I'll move quickly to Sydney and Radiance. Um, so I, I got involved with my um coalition when, like I said, when I was in the seventh grade. Um, I've always kind of been kind of close with the drug prevention field because of my mother. Um, my mother, she is a substance abuse counselor. But I really, when I got in high school, that's when I really started to kind of work more in the field. I guess what I'll say on my own and kind of really start being more involved. Um, I really got involved 
like extra extra involved i would say after when i first became a co-host in 2020 with the um radio show um back then i was just you know we were doing covid so we were always just doing our zoom meetings but as we like time went on and we were able to start like meeting the like other each other meeting other co-hosts and we was able to kind of connect with each other i just kind of got more involved with it through that and i was able to even work my way up to becoming the head host of the show now and being able to pick my own lead on um, my own co-host and being able to pick like my own guests and things of that sort i've also been able to um go i've attended kaka i want to say two last year or two years ago and now i really enjoy going there as well um and for th what was the second part of your question the um you, you the original question oh okay well great and um radiance okay um how about maya and um dylan yeah it's dylan but I got it. So one thing we can do is as a community is we can throw more community events like town hall meetings or just more things that we can help overlook the problem. As I know with my program, the DPD law enforcement explorers and also my father being a police officer, I know I need to stay away from that stuff. But if we're able to, <laughs> but if we're able to have more events and I also also put this stuff on social media more often than it can be seen at a wider audience. And then more people will know how to stay away from drugs, what not to do, and also be trained in Narcan, something else. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank all of our young people. I know even today you're juggling school, you're juggling work, and then you're juggling all this great prevention work you're doing throughout your communities. So I wanna thank you for your comments and your time. I wanna thank the adult leaders. I know it's hard work, but it's meaningful work and you're saving lives. And I appreciate all that you do. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but um, we this won't be the first time we'll be able to talk with young people and leaders um, about the work they're doing in the field because there are lots of coalitions that are doing great stuff around the country and the world and we wanna highlight them at CACA. Um, the next slide, um, Jesse. So next is um, the video from Juria's coalition that we are going to play. Yes, thank you. Hey, what my job free kids, yo. Drug free like me, yeah we drug free. It's the only way to be. You can search all around. You won't catch it on me. Young, white, and free, so fresh and so clean. Drug free, hog dealers, you should join the team. Yeah, I'm tasting dream, so pretty and pristine. Don't mean to be mean, but drugs ain't my scene. Yeah, I'll be outside, dealing hope and pride. You can't be my star. Me. 
I hope each of you have enjoyed our webinar today. Um, we had just a great time putting it together. And um, we just want to thank you all for, for being with us. Just a few announcements. Um, we have several things that are going on this year. Um, and we want your involvement. We have another webinar, October 29th which is CACA's Prevention Month webinar, New Tools, Stronger Communities, Immediate Effective Strategies for Coalitions Tackling Opioid Misuse. And let's not forget, February 3rd, SAMHSA's 21st Annual Prevention Day, Telling the Prevention Story, which will be at the Gaylord. And then following that will be um, CACA's 35th Annual National Leadership Forum. So there are lots of opportunities for you to get involved, um, call us anytime here at CACA or SAMHSA. We are here to help you be successful in your prevention work. And thank you all very, very much for joining us today. Thank you.